Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, who through Jesus Christ is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Great. Well, as uh, Alistair says this morning, we are actually going to start a new series in the run-up to Christmas, looking at the servant songs of Isaiah. As the title suggests, these songs are little glimpses in Isaiah's prophecy that point us to the servant of the Lord, the one who in all humility would come and suffer and die for humanity, yet in doing so would accomplish the plans and purposes of God to deliver the world from sin. And of course, the New Testament writers, often referring to these exact verses in Isaiah, confirm to us that this servant of the Lord is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the humble servant king. And that's why we're going to look at these servant songs in the run-up to Christmas, uh, to the run-up of the incarnation when Jesus first um, stepped on the earth as a man. Now, officially, there are four such servant songs in Isaiah. They can be found in chapters 42, 49, 50, and 52, which we're going to look at in turn over the next few weeks. But this morning, we're going to start a little bit earlier in Isaiah, in chapter 40. And we're picking up a part of the prophecy that, whilst not technically a servant song, nevertheless, similarly teaches us something about the character and purpose of Jesus that I think is particularly relevant in the run to Christmas. So the, the period of time before Christmas is called Advent. Anyone know what Advent means? It means coming. It means coming. And that's what we're going to see in this bit of Isaiah. But before we dive into it, let's, let's get some background to help us understand the context of where we are and what's going on in this passage. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet, which just means he was God's mouthpiece. He spoke God's word to God's people. And Isaiah lived at a time when God's people were in a right old mess. Right? You think we've got it bad, post-Brexit, post-Covid, surrounded by wars and disunity and economic depression. Well, well, 200 years before Isaiah was born, the nation of Israel had split into two kingdoms, north and south, Israel and Judah. And during Isaiah's lifetime, the northern kingdom of Israel was, well, it was decimated. It was defeated by the Assyrians and all the people were taken off into captivity. But the thing is, things weren't going much better for the southern kingdom where Isaiah lived. You see, everyone was doing whatever they pleased. There was no political or social or religious direction. They were in a right sorry old state. They too were heading for certain disaster. And the heart of the problem was not simply bad governance or weak leadership, but they'd all rejected God. They'd all rejected God. They lived it as if God doesn't exist. Oh, they paid lip service to him in the temple, but largely speaking, for the rest of their weeks, they just got on with doing their own thing, living their own lives. The thing is, God couldn't wait and wouldn't sit back and do nothing about this disloyalty and disrespect. So he sent his prophets to warn the people what would happen if they didn't change their ways. And Isaiah was one such prophet. Now, by this point in his prophecy, Isaiah has outlined for about 39 chapters just why God was rightly angry with the people and why then God was going to justly do something about all the things they'd done. But then we get this massive gear shift here in Isaiah chapter 40. And actually, this gear shift is the precursor for the next 10 chapters or so where we get the servant songs. Something monumental is about to happen. Someone significant is about to arrive on the scene someone is coming so if you've still got your bibles open look down with me at isaiah chapter 40 and just have a look at verse 3 and we'll see who it is who's about to arrive verse 3 says this a voice cries in the wilderness prepare a way now this command has also legitimately been translated as make way or or clear the way it's kind of like get out of the way now as a scene it's pretty dramatic isn't it you've got this disembodied voice crying out from nowhere, clear the way, make way. You can't see who's talking, but you get the sense that something big is about to happen. I mean, it's not every day a voice just speaks, is it? It's a bit like when you hear the sirens and you see the, the start of the blue lights flashing before the motorcade zooms past. All the traffic gets stopped. Clear the way, someone important is coming through. Or actually, I think it's a bit more like, you know that bit in Jurassic Park? Show my age again, I know. But you know that bit where the glass on the dashboard and it just starts to tremble? You know that bit? It's one of the greatest bits of cinematography. Tell me you know that bit, yeah? You can't see what's coming, 
but you know something big's about to arrive. Well, that's what's going on here. This is a truly seismic announcement because it doesn't actually just make glasses tremble on a dashboard or, or even just stop traffic. It changes geography. Look at verse 4. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low. Everything's going to get leveled out for this arrival. So the question we've got to ask is, who on earth is coming? Well, apart from stating the obvious verse 3, it tells us that it is the Lord. Uh, nevertheless, the original hearers would have already had a good idea about what to expect. They would have known what and who was about to arrive. You see, they would have known from the voice that a king was on the way. There's this uh, Babylonian inscription in the British Museum from around this time about a king who goes off to visit a far-off flung place in his kingdom. And the inscription just reads this, Make his way good. Renew his roads, make straight his path, carve him out a track. So you've got to remember in those days, there weren't, wasn't much infrastructure like we have today. There weren't motorways and A roads and bypasses, particularly out in the sticks. And of course, the king can't be expected to just travel on any old dirt tracks, can he? And so they literally had to make new roads for him. Now, funnily enough, we still kind of do the same thing today, don't we? Okay, we maybe don't build new roads per se, but no, it has been a while actually since a royal member of the royal family's visit Stockport. But when we lived in London, the Queen came and opened a new local high school. And the council spade, spent just weeks making the way good. They fixed the potholes, they remarked the bus lanes, they cut the hedges, they were making everything straight for the Queen's arrival. And we do it for two reasons, don't we? Firstly, it's symbolic of authority. It shows respect and, and deference to the monarch. It says, we welcome you here. We've made an effort for you. We've knocked down all these barriers and bridged these gaps. It symbolizes our submission to the king's authority. But secondly, it's also symbolic of the king's ability to bring order to his kingdom, his, his mandate to fix things, to, to heal the rifts and get things back on track. That's actually the bigger idea here in Isaiah, considering their context. This king is coming to an inaccessible, inhospitable, impassable wilderness. And yet because of him, it's all going to get leveled out. The king is going to make all things new. I don't know about you, but in such a time as this, with, well, I'm guessing justifiable distrust in politicians and world leaders, we just might not be able to believe any king could do this. Any king could do such a thing. I mean, how has been being under the authority of a king figure ever made life better for anyone? It doesn't work, does it? Not in our experience. Or does it? Because you only need to follow the fortunes of a sports team like Wrexham to see that under good leadership, the team and town flourishes. Whereas under the previous bad regime, everything was threatening to fall apart. It's the same, isn't it, at work? It's the same at school. It's true in all aspects of life. Under good leadership, people flourish, but under a bad leader, they do not. When good authority is rightly exercised, it's like rain on a thirsty field to those who live under that authority. A good king brings hope and optimism and peace. The thing is, we've grown sceptical because our current experience, world history tells us there's no earthly power like this. There's no earthly king like this. It's what we all want, even if we know we can't have it. So I actually, I'd argue as a culture, we're kind of obsessed, aren't we, with superhero stories and, and legends and myths like Robin Hood and, and King Arthur. We long for characters who will stand up for justice and righteousness, who will who defeat the common enemies for the common good. It's what we all want deep inside us. And these stories are in our culture and in our, our cinemas because... It's here in our nature, isn't it? Our hope, our desire is that such a king would come and put everything right. Such a king would come and rule equitably and fairly. Such a king would, would come and make everything right. And yet our experiences, instead of this amazing, powerful, benevolent king, we get Rushi Sunak and Joe Biden. But that's why this prophecy is wonderfully different. You see, when human kings come, all they can do is attempt to bridge the gaps. They can try to do the best of a bad job. But when this king comes, 
See what Isaiah says? The gap disappears. It's literally filled in. There's no tunneling or structural engineering. No, the mountains are brought down and the valleys are filled. So that, verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is the promise of Isaiah chapter 40. A king is coming who is like no other. A king who will bring healing and restoration, justice and reconciliation. A king who can pave a way through impassable mountains, who can fill the valleys and bridge the gaps. This king is coming. But here's the problem. See, whilst Isaiah's listeners would have been really excited at the thought of this justice-wielding, peace-bringing king coming to make everything right, the previous 39 chapters of judgment and woe would tell them that if this king did indeed come, if he did bring justice, ultimate justice, then well, where would they stand before him? In fact, if this king came today, then where would you and I stand? Would we be able to say there's no barrier to his reign? No gap in our allegiance to him? Would God's king be welcome in our lives? Because when you think of it like that, the reality of a, an all-powerful king is, is kind of terrifying, isn't it? When we're real with ourselves, well, then we recognize that we're far from loyal and faithful to him. Of course we're not totally depraved, like totally evil, of course not. But nevertheless, our thoughts, our hearts, our actions, they prove us time and time again to be, well, disloyal and disrespectful to God and his king. Just like the people in Isaiah's day, we too live in God's world without truly paying deference to him. We live as if God and his king don't really exist. And whilst we might pay some kind of lip service to him on a Sunday, largely speaking, we all just get on and do our own thing for the rest of the week. So the question is, what should happen when this king comes? Now, these first readers would have only been too aware of how kings dealt with rebellious subjects. Those found guilty of treason would either be exiled or executed. But here's the great news of this passage. Mercifully, that's not the case with this king. Remember, he's not coming to bring despair. He's coming to bring hope and peace. So just rewind with me to verse 1. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Do you notice that? Despite all their rebellion against him, all their, all their sin and nonsense, all the evil stuff, no, they still remain his people. Whatever else they've done and whatever would happen to them, they still would remain his people. And so he say, speaks to them tenderly. And God tells them that their struggles, their, their conflict, their war has ended. How can this be? Surely that can't mean that God has just simply brushed everything, all their rebellion, all, all their sin, he's just brushed it under the carpet, you know, forgive and forget and all that. How could that be just and right and true? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. God has forgiven them, but precisely because he has dealt with their problem. Look at verse 2. Her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, iniquity and sin are just the Bible's words for that rebellion, that rejection of God and his king that we've been talking about this morning. But what Isaiah says here is that the people's sin has been paid for. Their debt has been cancelled. Their war is over because they've received from the Lord double for all their sins. Now, on first reading, we might make a little mistake here. We might mean that that's God punishing them twice, hitting them doubly. You know, the reason he can be satisfied and say that the war's over now is because he's got his vengeance. The people have paid doubly. They've been punished twice for their sins. And yet that doesn't stack up in the context, does it? I mean, how would that bring comfort to anyone? Could you imagine being in a courtroom where the judge says, Mr. Causey, your sentence is two years in prison, but to give you comfort, I'm going to double it to four doesn't work that does it that's not comforting so it can't mean that and the incredible thing we begin to realize here in Isaiah is that it's not the punishment that's been doubled but the payment the payment coming from God's own hand God has paid double so that the people have received from the Lord's hand double for all their sins 
This is incredible, isn't it? Because all of the religions and philosophies tell us that, that we can earn favour with God by working hard, by doing good things, by helping old ladies over the road. You know, you can do it. You can make the grade. And yet, as we've seen, it's impossible to show that kind of absolute allegiance to God and his king. But, you know, there's also a second misunderstanding and one that's sadly particularly prevalent with Christians. And it goes something like this, that, that when God forgives us our sins and he mercifully wipes the sleet clean, sleet slate clean, that's easy for me to say, well, then we get the opportunity to start all over. We get the chance to finally prove our worth, to, to earn our place again. And this, unfortunately, is the position of so many Christians. God has forgiven me so that now I can try harder. Now I can really show him what I can do. But then as the trials and temptations of life take their toll, when the failures begin to inevitably outweigh the successes, well, we can be left wondering, have I, have I done enough? Will it ever be enough? It's another film. I'm, I'm old, I know. Saving Private Ryan, have you seen that? There's a really harrowing bit of that film, and I don't mean the, the attack on the beach in Normandy at the beginning of the film. I mean at the end of the film, when the captain is, he's been shot and he's dying. And as uh, Private Ryan is, is, is like thinking about what's happened, uh, the captain turns to him and says, earn this. What a horrible thing to say to him, earn this. And then the camera flashes forward to like 50 years, and Private Ryan is now sat weeping at the, the tombstone of the captain who saved him. And he turns to his wife and says, tell me that I earned it. Tell me that I lived a good life. But, you know, we know, even if he did live a decent life, would he ever really have earned that? Could he ever say that with any confidence? I think that would have crippled him. That would have been horrible. But, you know, the wonderful reality that Isaiah reveals to us here is we don't, we don't do that. No, because God has paid double. So yes, absolutely, amazingly, the slate is wiped clean for us. God can and will forgive us all of our sins, but much more than that, far more than that, in his grace, he gives double payment for our sins. God's offer is not just to balance our account, but to leave us in credit. I think actually it's quite useful to think of this in kind of financial terms. Spiritually speaking, our rebellion, our sin has left us in debt and we're in no position to do anything about it. We have no earning potential, no savings stashed away for a rainy day. But then God comes and not only pays off the debt, balancing our account, but he credits us with a fortune. Meaning we don't have to earn anything anymore. We're in credit, massive credit. Enough credit that we will never find ourselves back in debt. This is the amazing truth of the gospel. Double payment. God forgives our unrighteousness and then credits us with a righteousness that is not our own. And we can be secure in the knowledge that whilst we don't deserve it, whilst we could never earn it, we don't need to. Because God has paid it for us. He has paid it all. But how can that be? How can that be? If we don't deserve it, if, if, if it shouldn't be ours, how do we get it? Well, that's precisely why God is sending his king to us. You see, instead of coming to conquer and subdue the world, God's king is actually coming to serve. And as we carry on our journey through the servant songs in Isaiah, we're going to see exactly how this will play out. That God's king truly is a servant king. One who does everything for his people. You know, we get a taste of what's to come here in this passage. Look with me at verse 10. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And as you're imagining now, a victorious Caesar-style leader riding into town on his chariot with all his troops as this mighty conqueror. We'll just read on to verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Do you see this? He is a warrior... And yet he's also a shepherd. He is mighty and all-powerful, and yet he's also humble and kind. He has ultimate authority, but he uses that authority to bring justice and reconciliation to his people. He has come to the aid of his people, to rescue his people, to gather them up like a shepherd, to carry them close to his heart. It's a great picture for us, isn't it? Because a shepherd does everything for the benefit of his sheep. He leads them to good pasture. He helps them avoid disaster. He protects them from attack. 
The Bible actually says that the good shepherd is prepared even to lay down his life for his sheep. Well, this king that is coming is exactly that good shepherd. The one who's willing to give himself for his sheep. The one who's willing to give of himself. Willing to graciously pay double from his own account. This is who is coming. And this is why he's coming. And this is why Christmas is always worth celebrating and remembering. Jesus is coming to pay double for his people's sins so that he can be restored and reconciled to God. And God will do it. Look at verse 28. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him that has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. God can and will keep his promise, and he sends his king, the one who pays double for his people. And Isaiah says, you know, knowing that, knowing the blessing of being under God's king, well, that's going to put a skip in your step, put wind in your sails, so that you can soar like an eagle. And yet the thing is, for Isaiah and the people, time came and went, and yet this king did not immediately appear. The promised servant king, the shepherd king, he started to become more of a, a myth, more of a, a legend, a distant hope. But then hundreds of years later, a voice did come calling from the wilderness, calling for the people to make way and to prepare a way for God's king. Some people thought it was crazy. Many couldn't believe it. And yet, as if to highlight Isaiah's prophecy, this king was born in humility in a stable, surrounded by shepherds. He truly was the servant shepherd king. And as Jesus grew up to be a man, he preached a righteousness that comes not from man, not from our efforts, comes from God and he offered a way to God through grace and not through works he offered the free gift of life to all who would believe and whilst they couldn't see it he was God's servant shepherd king who would come willingly to exchange his all for them guys this is the gospel this is the good news that our hope is based on Jesus Christ did not just die the death that you and I should have died but he also lived the life that we should have lived and in him, our bad record is not just transferred so that he is punished as we deserve on the cross. But the Bible says his great and perfect record is transferred to us when we believe in him. So that now God treats us only as he really deserves, as children of God. Friends, this is double payment. This is grace. This is amazing grace. This is the gospel. This is why God sent his King Jesus. It's what he came to do for us and for all mankind. Now, I'm guessing this morning there's going to be all sorts of different thoughts and reactions to this. Maybe you're someone who already, already knows the king. And you want others to know. You want your families to know, your children, your friends, your colleagues, to know this gracious offer of double payment. I mean, surely that's our prayer as a church, isn't it? That our communities, that our families would come to understand and look to the total security of sins forgiven and eternity secured that comes to the double payment of Jesus. Well, if that is you, look at what Isaiah commends us to do, verse 9. Going up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Going up to a high hill, maybe Werneth Low, I don't know. O herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. Say to Stockport, behold your God. This is good news. Jesus is the greatest news, so don't be afraid of sharing it, of telling others about him. But just remember, and I'm keen to stress this, remember our job's not to argue with people or to convince them of anything. No, our job is to simply tell them the good news. Just tell them the good news, shout it out. Go tell it on the mountains. Here is your God. Our prayer should be that we would delight in Jesus our King. Knowing him and making him known. Serving him as he served us. But you know, if you sat here this morning and all this is a little bit new to you, if you're still kind of weighing up this stuff, then do please continue to do that. Come back week after week and hear more from this series in Isaiah, more of the Christmas story, more of the gospel. Because whether or not you believe in this king yet, 
I hope at least you want him to be true. I hope deep down you'd love that offer of double payment to be genuine. If that is you, my prayer for you is that as we continue to learn about the wonderful truths of Jesus from the sermon songs in Isaiah, that you too were to come believe, to believe that he is the truth, that he is the king, that actually he is your servant king. Well, let's pray to him now. Father God, we praise you that our King has come. That we stand this side of Christmas and we know that he's, he has arrived. And we have his offer. His good offer. Of sins forgiven. Of life restored. Of double payment. Father, help us to see, to believe, to trust in Jesus and to build our lives on him. Amen.